Let's take our Bibles tonight. Open up with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7. In this series, I have been using a book uh, from Striving Together Publications called The Christian Counselor's Guidebook. I mentioned it when we began. Uh, just been using it because they have a variety of topics alphabetically listed and helps kind of give me a direction of where we are going. Uh, but kind of just picking and choosing the ones that, that I thought would be good, would be relevant. And tonight's topic is one that I nearly skipped over. And I thought, eh, I can't see where this would be that much of a needed topic. And actually, I've been wrestling with this topic for two weeks. And as I wrestled with this uh, and studying it for tonight, the Lord just opened it up on Monday and showed me um, just how pervasive the topic really is. Uh, so let me set it up with a question. How many of you, as a kid, went to church camp or went to some kind of camp? Just put your hands up if you would. All right? So church camp, 4-H camp, whatever. How many of you enjoyed camp? Put your hands back up. How many of you hated camp? Yeah, my hand's up with that too. About four of us. Okay. Um, I am sure, I went to one time to CEF camp, and I think that was in Winona Lake is where we went for CEF camp. Went one time, hated every second of it. And I'm sure there was absolutely nothing wrong with the camp itself because uh, a lot of you, if you grew up in this church, you went to CEF camp as well and had a great time at it and wanted to go back year after year after year. Uh, back when I went, I was a third grader and I was as shy and as bashful as I could possibly be. And it was my first time away from home. We get dropped off at camp and immediately everybody else, because everybody else had been there before, they deserted me like a hot potato. And I was not the meet and greet kind of a person. I just kind of wanted to hole up in a corner with people I knew and ease into this thing. Not them, man. They wanted to connect with the other churches and everybody else that they had known from camp from years before. And so I'm left kind of in the lurch. And so that's how camp began for me. And then everybody wanted to go swimming. I don't swim. I did it then. I don't swim now. You say, well, you should have taken lessons. I did. <laughs> and I sunk like a rock. They took me out and they says, well, do this, do this, do this. And I says, I am doing that. No, you can't be. I can't tread water. I can float. Well, dead people can float. <laughs> I can float. And she went underwater and she watched me. She popped back up and she says, you're right, you are doing all the right things. I says, I told you that. So I can't swim worth a hoot. I can get into the pool, I can get from one side to the other, and after that, I'm done. What's the point? And so I didn't swim. Then they wanted to go play ping pong. As a, I had only seen a ping pong table in a magazine or on television. I never picked one up. I didn't know what to do with this thing. So I'm out there. Then I found out that everybody else who went to camp their moms evidently couldn't cook because they thought camp food was cuisine. I thought it was the most disgusting, putrid garbage I'd ever put in my mouth. And they made sure that we finished everything that was on our plate at breakfast. This, this oatmeal could have been used for wallpaper paste. It was the most horrible stuff ever. And we had to choke that garbage down. They had this gumdrop tree. Any of you that went to CF camp remember the gumdrop tree? It was put on the end of the table, and the first table to finish their food got the gumdrop tree. Guess what? Any table I was sitting at never won. That really made me very popular throughout the entire week of the camp. So, miserable, awful time at camp. Finally, by Friday... I had a camp counselor that it took him all week to figure out that, hey, one of my kids is not happy here. Thanks. We waited till Friday. And so I remember this guy just put his arm around me, talked to me. And I, I spent the whole week crying. I mean, I really did. Not outward where everybody was at. I'd just find some quiet place. I'd hole up in a bathroom stall and I just cried. 
And I'd go to bed crying, and I just thought, spent the whole stinking week crying. And after he talked to me Friday night, I felt better, but then I also probably felt better because I knew I'm going home tomorrow. So I, I just absolutely hated camp. I was so homesick, it wasn't funny. Tonight's sermon that I nearly skipped over because this is how I'm thinking of it. I'm thinking camp, homesickness. This is not really applicable to us as adults, is it? Uh, we would call this maybe the Dorothy syndrome, where we want to click our heels three times and say, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. If I could have done that at CEF camp, I'd have done it. I'd have put on those ruby slippers and gone home, because it was awful. But, you know, think about homesickness from a little bit of a different perspective. College students, they go through some homesickness sometimes, especially if they go far away from home. Uh, those going into the military, especially those, uh, the weeks of basic training, boot camp, where you are cut off from everything and anybody you know so that they, you can be focused getting training. Or maybe you get deployed almost immediately to some place and you can't even tell anybody where you're going. Newlyweds, more so girls maybe than guys, but especially if they are moving uh, from all the, that they knew that was familiar to some place that is very unfamiliar. Those who experience job transfers, missionaries, missionaries. And again, I think especially maybe the wives deal with it a little bit more because the guys are going to do the, their husbands, you know, they, get, they hit the ground running, and man, we're doing this and this and this, and she's setting up the house, she's watching the kids, and feels very isolated. So there's a lot of homesickness that goes on. Homesickness alone is not a sin, but if it is handled improperly, it can very quickly become sinful. And tonight, maybe you say, okay, all the things you just mentioned, I don't deal with any of that. Well, here's what kicked into my brain. How many times as adults do we kind of look over our shoulders and go, things just aren't the same anymore? And we reminisce about the good old days, wishing we were back there. That's homesickness. Oh, things were so much better back then. Things are just a train wreck now. My life's not what it used to be. Oh, it was so much better there than it is here. That's homesickness as well. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 and verse 10. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. It's not a good thing to pine for the good old days, is it? Now, there's nothing wrong with having good memories and enjoying good memories. There's nothing wrong with learning from the past. But we don't live back there. We don't live in yesteryear. There is no way we can run the clock backwards. We are here right now. So if we are homesick and moaning and groaning for the past, we need to do something about that. So, tonight, there's going to be one major point and sub-points that will go under it. Take your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 12. The main point that we get tonight is this. Learn from people in the Bible who were separated from their homes and their family. Learn from people in the Bible who were separated from their homes and their families. What we want to do to begin this tonight, we want to look at some of these individuals so we know who we're talking about and what they experienced. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. He didn't tell him where they're going, just said, Go. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Let's take a look at another passage. Go with me to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. We know the story of Ruth. We know that 
uh, Naomi and her family, they moved from uh, Bethlehem, Judah. They went into Moab. While they're in Moab, uh, the boys have taken on wives of the Moabites. The dad dies, the boys die, and Naomi is left with her two Moabite daughter-in-laws. And it says in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 8, Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Jump to verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. There's plenty of other examples in the Bible of those who were separated from their family, from their homelands, from all that was familiar, from their friends, things that that they had known perhaps all of their lives. For instance, how about Joseph? Uh, Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers, sold to the Midianites, and eventually sold into Egypt. David, he was exiled from his wife and his home uh, when Saul was chasing after him, trying to kill him. Naaman's maid, she was torn for her home and family and brought to a life of servitude in a foreign country. Daniel, Look at Daniel. Daniel was sold into slavery, uh, into into captivity, into Babylon. Paul, he spent long periods of time away from his home, his churches that he had started, people that he was familiar with. The greatest of all the examples of somebody that was left their homeland for someplace different is Jesus Christ. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 5. Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a serpent, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus left his home to come here for you and I. What lessons can we learn from these Bible characters? What do they teach us concerning homesickness? The first lesson is this. Realize that God has you where you're at for a reason. Realize God has you where you're at for a reason. Go back with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 50. While you're turning to Genesis, chapter 50, let's set this up a little bit. I mentioned a moment ago about Joseph. At the age of 17, Joseph is assaulted by his brothers, and he's thrown into a pit. Imagine what Joseph must have felt what he must have thought, how it must have torn him up to think that his brothers would do something like this to him. At the age of 17, he is sold into slavery. He is sold to the Midianites, who in turn sell him to the Pharaoh or into Egypt. He was 30 when he was elevated to second in command by the Pharaoh. So between the ages of 17 and 30, a lot happens in his life. He has been accused of of trying to rape uh, this woman. He has been put in prison. He has seen one individual released and another individual was killed. He finally gets his release. He is elevated to the second in command position. He prophesies that seven good years are going to come, followed by seven bad years, seven lean years. We find out that Joseph is 37 years old when the lean years come. And two years into the famine, which would have made him 37 years, or excuse me, would have made him between 39 to 40 years old, the brothers show up. They don't recognize him, and they need food. 
from the age of 17 to somewhere between 39 to 40 years old. All this time he has been separated from home. All this time, here's what he could have done. He could have gotten bitter. He could have been angry. He could have been vengeful and spiteful. He could have done everything in his power to escape and to get back home. But what does he do? For all that time, he stays put in Egypt. Now, the brothers show up. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. This is after the revelation that, okay, we're your brothers and all this kind of stuff. Verse 15, the dads died. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. Joseph said, I am where God put me, and I am here for good. I am here to do good. But do you also recognize that Joseph didn't say, okay, shoot, all this is taken care of, it's under the rug kind of thing, and, and I've forgiven you, blah, blah, blah. Let's go home. Joseph said, I am home. Come join me. He welcomed him in and says, I'll take care of you. He had found a new place to call home. And he recognized that he had a purpose there. God opened the door for you to go to a particular college. God provided you with a particular job. God gave you that mate that says we're going to move someplace. God called you to a mission field. You are where you're at for a purpose. For a divine reason. You know what? You're not even here tonight by chance or accident. You're here by divine appointment. God knew you was going to be here. God has something for you. There's a purpose. There is a reason for where you're at. And if Joseph can have the right attitude and frame of mind concerning all that he went through, certainly we can too, can't we? By the way, a homesick person has to come to this conclusion on their own. You're not going to get them there by badgering them to that point. they got to come to that conclusion because when they do, they're going to own it. And it is going to be like the light bulb just bing, and it's going to be a wonderful thing for them. Here's the second thing. Find security in a person, not a place. Find your security in a person, not a place. Go to Psalm 139. You say, what do you mean? Well, so many people, so many times we pine about where we have been, and it's a place. It might be where we used to live. It might be where we used to work. It might be used to the people that we used to be with as far as um, going places, doing things, and all that kind of stuff. We put our security in all the wrong things. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. 
If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be a light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 41. Isaiah 41, look at verse 10. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Did you realize that if we have found our security in the wrong things, God just might take those away from us so that we'll find our security in the right thing, the right person? If our security has been in all these other things and we're just so comfortable in them and all that kind of stuff, where in the world did we get the idea that God wants us comfortable? He wants us conformed to the image of His Son. And that means being willing to go, to do, to you know, be taken wherever the Lord wants us to go. Our security is not in a place. Our security has always got to be in a person. And if our security is in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're in good shape. It's so easy to get comfortable. But with comfort comes complacency. And when we become complacent, we are not going to be constructive. We're not going to be constructive. If we're just kind of coasting through life, comfortable, oh, everything's just status quo, we're not going to accomplish a lot. God has to rock our boat sometimes, don't He? How many of you like to have your boat rocked? I don't either. Sometimes the Lord has to do it just to get us to trust in Him. Now, is there anything wrong with sticking close to home and in territory that's familiar? Absolutely not. Provided that's where the Lord's got you. Provided that's where the Lord's put you. You say, well, that's easy for you to say. You're right back where you started. You're right back home. You're living on family farm. That's familiar territory. You know all the roads around here and all that kind of stuff. Easy for you to say. Well, I started out as a typical kid, and when I got done with high school, little old Bryan, Ohio, I wanted to see it in the rearview mirror and say, bye-bye. I wanted the city life. Let me tell you something. One year of Toledo and one year of Chattanooga, and I've had enough city life to last me a lifetime. Don't ever care to go back to a city. You say, well, Brian's a city. Uh-uh. It ain't nothing. It did a little old town. This is, as, this is big enough for me. I tell you what, that's no fun living in the cities. And if, and if you're thinking, oh, I love it, you'll grow up eventually. You'll grow out of that. The church that we pastored, first, the first full-time pastorate up in Michigan, we left the city of Chattanooga and went to a place with a population of about 200, and that's if you counted all the cats. <laughs> and there was plenty in the neighborhood. So, and it was out in the middle of no place. I mean, when you had to drive a half an hour to go get groceries, and you had to drive an hour to go to, at that time it was Kmart's, you know, to get to a Kmart, that's where you was at, just a place like that. And we were there for uh, three years. And let me tell you something. I didn't come looking for this place. I did not come looking to come back home. Pastor Bennett came looking for me. And I'll be honest with you. Please don't understand what I am saying. I prayed this church would vote no. I did not want to come back here. Not because I had anything against this church. Not because I had anything against the people. We loved where we were. We loved the people. We were working in a church. We were watching this church grow. 
we saw the Lord doing some really great things there. Uh, when we got there, the, the former pastor had done some uh, very destructive things. In the church, we had about 50 people that we started with, and it was just dying as we came on the scene. Uh, after three years, God had blessed, and we were running about 135 in the services. That's pretty good out in the middle of no place. Um, just, we love the ministry there. We love the people. Um, and so when Pastor Bennett asked if I would be interested in coming here, I says, not really. <laughs> I don't want to leave there. He says, will you pray about it? I said, yeah, I guess. And so the Lord began opening up doors here. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done, was to have left there. Let me tell you something. For about my first two years here, I was homesick for there. Because I really miss those people. It is amazing. You say, well, you was home. Home is where God takes you and places you and where he gives you the purpose and the reason to fulfill what he's called you to do. And that was a very special place. Now, if God called me someplace from here, I would be saying, are you interested? No, not really. Because this is home. Not because I grew up here, but because we love the people. Because we love the church. Because we love the ministry that God has given us. Not because it's Bryan, Ohio. Not because where I graduated from is, is 10 miles away. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do about with being where God put you, where God called you, and knowing that you're where God called you. If you're in the place where God has you, then there's got to be a peace that you allow to come into your heart to chase away that homesickness for where you've been. Our security doesn't come from a place. It comes from a person. The old saying is true. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he guides, he provides. I like it better in uh, one of our invitation hymns. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he lays me, I will wallow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Do we feel like that? Is our security in a person, not a place? Here's the third thing. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. For the individual that's homesick, for the individual that's pining for the past, if you don't stop looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to wreck yourself. If you don't stop looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to wreck yourself. Paul said in Philippians 3, 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything be ye otherwise minded, God reveal even this unto you. Pressing forward. That's the direction we're supposed to be moving. God wants us to be moving that direction. If we're moaning and groaning about, oh, back here, back then, and things were so much better, I wish I could go back, you're looking in a rear view mirror. How's that going to work out if you're driving your car like that? It's just a matter of time for you hit something. And if that's how you're going through a day, looking in a rearview mirror, it's just a matter of time before you're going to wreck. Your life is going to wreck. You know why? Because you're not looking at what God's got right in front of you. You're not appreciating, you're not grateful, you're not thankful for what He has put in your life today because you're too busy moaning and groaning about yesterday and the past. So we've got to look forward. Here's the fourth thing, fourth lesson. Homesickness, though not a sin in and of itself, will develop into sinful attitudes if we don't check it quickly. 
Homesickness, though not sinful in and of itself, will develop into sinful attitudes if we don't check it quickly. Discouragement, depression, discontentment. Is that anything that God wants us to experience? Does he want us to be discouraged? Does God want us to go through the day all gloomy and down and depressed? Does God want us discontented? My Bible tells us we're supposed to have contentment. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Now the word state means our circumstance. Whatever circumstances I'm in, they're in be content. But going along with our topic tonight, let's take it the way we had interpret it in the English. Whatever state I am in, whether it's Ohio, or we lived for about a year in Georgia, and then a four and a half years or so in Tennessee, and then three years in, you know, up there. Wherever the Lord has you, whatever state He has you in, be content. Because you cannot find any biblical justification whatsoever to be discontented. And you may get your back up and say, well, I'm not going to be here forever. Oh, keep telling God that. See how that works out for you. Or tell the Lord, I'll never go there. <laughs> I really believe our Lord chuckles. He has to. Just tell him what you're not going to do. And watch how that unfolds in your life. It's a choice we got to make if we're going to have the right attitude. Let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. All the way back to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, look at verse 11. Now, remember, where's Nehemiah at? He's in captivity. Nehemiah 1, 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in, thy, in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Serve where you are. Serve where you are. You say, well, I don't want to get too involved because then God will move me someplace else. Just as soon as I get really deeply involved, God will move me. You don't know that. You do not know what tomorrow holds. All you know is that you've got today. Serve Him. Serve Him where you're at. You say, well, Nehemiah didn't have any choice. Well, he kind of did. He could have told the king no and he'd be dead. Or maybe the king would have gave him a, even a far worse job. Although being the king's cupbearer is a very highly trusted position, but you get to taste all the king's food. People like to poison their kings. So provided the food was good, you got a good taste of some good food. If the food was bad, you died first. So either it's going to be a good meal, or you die. So, you know, what a job to have, right? Every bite of every meal. Can you imagine? King gets a snack. King, go on a diet. Stop eating so much. Because everything that had to be tested by the king's cupbearer. He had a job to do. Wherever God's put you, serve him. Find a way to get involved and serve the Lord. Let me give you just a couple more real quick as we close this out. Use those longings for home. This is the sixth thing. Use the longings for home as a reminder to pray for those people. The Apostle Paul did that in Philippians 1. God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. 
you have good memories from something in the past, from a place that you used to live, from a place you used to work, and you, you, man, you just really enjoyed that job, you enjoyed those people, a neighborhood you used to live in, a school you used to be in, and there's people that just, you made great friendships with them. You got one of two choices. We going to mope around all day, boo-hooing and crying like I did at camp? <laughs> or are you going to say, thanks, Lord, for bringing them to my mind. I'm going to pray for them today. And you just ask the Lord how you could best pray for them. And here's the last thing. Remember that ultimately, no place is home in this world. No place is home in this world. No place. You think here is because you've lived here forever. This isn't home. You think someplace else is. That's not home. The past isn't home. The present isn't home. Heavens are home. We're just passing through. So, why do we bother getting so attached to the point that it would cause sadness and homesickness and all that kind of stuff? Now, I realize that we've been talking to Christians. And if, as a Christian, you're going through these things, and remember how I started this. It doesn't have to have anything to do with this. It could be simply a matter of pining for the past. And if you know a Christian that's going through this, we want to be as sympathetic as we possibly can, empathetic to what they're going through. But we also have to encourage them with truth. And God's truth will help you get over this stuff. It'll help you to look at what God has given you today with gratitude, with excitement, with a joy, with a sense of purpose, knowing that you're where God has you for now. Do any of us know where God has us going tomorrow? We only think we do. We know where we're at right now. That's all we've got. That's all we need to be concerned about. Do any of us know that we're going to get home tonight? No. We've got this moment right here. This is what we got. So let's enjoy it. Let's thank God for the time that He has given us. Let's thank God for drawing us together to a particular place for this moment. Let's use this moment for His honor and glory. Let's serve Him to the best of our abilities. Let's give Him all we got. Because He deserves it. And knowing that tomorrow, wherever He takes us, unless He calls us home to heaven, wherever He takes us tomorrow is still not home. Home is yet to come. If you're dealing with a lost person that's going through these homesick feelings, boy, this is a great opportunity to show them comfort from God's Word. To take them through these steps and then to introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ who gives an individual purpose, who, is, who has brought us into this world. He has created us. And his desire is that we would all come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And that that individual, you can know this Lord. You can know this Comforter personally. And introduce him to Christ. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you say, I don't know him. How can I know Christ as my Savior? The plan of salvation is so simple. The plan of salvation really starts with one fact. Every one of us is a sinner headed to an eternal hell. Every one of us is condemned. we got to know that to begin with before the gospel message means something because accepting the gospel message is not accepting just another good thing into our life. It's not like in January you get a gym membership or something like that and just try to add something better to better your life. There's nothing like that. We are condemned sinners headed to an eternal hell. We come into this world with that condemnation upon us. But God so loved each and every one of us that He gave His only begotten Son. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ is the plan of salvation. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried in the tomb. He arose again from the grave. There is nothing else to the plan of salvation. You either accept that or you reject it. There's nothing in between. You accept it in its entirety without addition or subtraction to it or you reject it. Would tonight be the night that you'd accept it? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this evening. If the Lord is dealing with you about your salvation tonight, you say, I, I don't have that peace in my heart. I know that I don't have that forgiveness. Then right now, would you pray something like this? Dear God, I'm a sinner. I know it. And I'm asking Jesus for you to forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was buried in the tomb. I believe he rose from the grave. I believe he did every bit of that for me. And because of me, I am the cause of why Jesus had to do this. Because I'm a sinner that needs saved. And tonight, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. To save me. To cover my sins in your blood. And with the power of new life in Christ to give me the new life that I need. Have you prayed something like that tonight? You say, I, I did. I meant that with all my heart. Did you just slip your hand up this evening? Then our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you, Lord, that wherever you have placed us, for however long that may be, that you can give us that sense of belonging, a sense that this is our temporary home, a love for the people that you have put in our path, a, a sense of what we can do for you in service. And Lord, help us to just put it all out there for you. And we pray and ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.